Just as we tend to say that beauty is in the eye of the beholder, we have to admit once in a while that deception is in part to be blamed on the people who are themselves being deceived. Initially, when I started uh, researching the religiosity of Sam Harris, I mostly blamed him for the deception. But as the evidence started to pile up on my desk, I couldn't help but feel that there's a very eager participation on the part of the audience and some of the journalists and middlemen. Look at this chart here. When you look at the left-hand side of the screen, that's probably the side of Sam Harris you're more accustomed to seeing and hearing about. His name linked to this uh, foundation he created himself, Project Reason. But that's not the only foundation <laughs> that he's associated with. He's also an important member of and leader of the Hanuman Foundation. When you instead see him in the context of religious leaders who he himself propounds as having had a profound and important impact on his own life, people who he himself says his own meditation practice, his own practice as a guru and leader is inspired by, modeled on, derivative of, then we start to see a very different Sam Harris. But to his credit, he hasn't really kept this concealed. It's been an open secret because I think members of the public wanted to be deceived. They wanted to see Sam Harris as he appears there on the left-hand side of the screen. They just didn't want to see what was hidden in plain sight, what was obvious all along, that he is the kind of guy who becomes the secretary and treasurer of the Hanuman Foundation. And in case you imagine that some kind of uh, tremendously respectable uh, academic institution for the study of Hinduism as a religion, no, it's not. No, it's not. There's nothing respectable about it. It is a religious foundation that exists to propound the teaching of the white Western gentleman whose photographs in the middle of the screen there. It is a foundation that propounds the spiritual insights of highly eccentric self-made guru Ram Das. And no, that's not the name he was born with, but to be fair, Isil Mazard is not the name I was born with either. When we look at the list of spiritual leaders, including the one I just mentioned, that Sam Harris attaches his own name to, uh, people who he says are supremely uh, advanced, enlightened thinkers and perfected beings, people who demonstrate how wonderful the spiritual path is, and people who've inspired his own uh, practice of teaching meditation. When we look at this list of names, they aren't doing anything to conceal their overtly religious nature. Nobody here is lying about who they are and what they're teaching, except for Sam Harris. So I mean, sometimes you can judge a book by the cover, and sometimes you can't. When you look here at Tolku Urgyan Rinpoche, Nyoshkul Ken Rinpoche, Sayada Upandita, when you look at these names and you look at these, these photographs, I'm sure nothing leaps into your mind that these are secular scientists presenting teachings or presenting methods of meditation that are strictly based on the, the latest highly skeptical inquiries into neuroscience, into the science of consciousness. These are traditional religious authority figures. So why is it that when a white Western supposedly scientific figure like uh, Sam Harris steps forward and repeats the same teachings and the same similes verbatim that these people use. When he, and he credits his sources, fairly enough, he says he studied meditation with these people, that he is now making money, he charges a fee of $120 annually for you to download the app and you can close your eyes and cross your legs and hear his voice. When he is giving you this guided meditation, if he is repeating verbatim, what religious authority figures have taught as religion. How could it possibly be that the same doctrine or the same philosophy ceases to be religious when it comes out of the mouth of a white-faced, clean-shaven Western male as opposed to these gentlemen whom he named as his spiritual teachers as the source of his teachings who are wearing various forms of religious robes? And obviously, uh, just to dial back to uh, Ram Das here, some of these figures who are his guiding inspirations, 
They were white Western people who also chose to dress in the uh, exotic robes of the Far East. Okay, but our list is not complete. After Sayadaw Upandita, we also have H. W. L. Punja. You can judge a book by its cover, people. This guy is exactly what he seems to be. He is the bad stereotype of the Indian mystic guru. And you can look up for yourself the unstinting praise that Sam Harris has on this guy. Do you think, do you think, just, just let's just judge a book by its cover for a moment here. What do you think the other members of the so-called four horsemen of atheism would have to say about H.W.L. Punja. You can look it up, you can do the reading, you can listen to lectures from all these people on YouTube, including H.W.L. Punja himself. What do you think um, any of the other famed and acclaimed leaders of so-called secular, atheist, anti-clerical, anti-religious movements in the West, what do you think the leaders of Project Reason would have to say about the doctrine and teaching of H.W.L. Punja. And then what does Sam Harris have to say, by contrast? How can it possibly be that the same teachings about meditation, spirituality, enlightenment, the worldview, ceases to be religious, becomes secular and scientific, just because it's Sam Harris who's saying it, instead of a man whom he acknowledges as his own teacher and spiritual guru, H.W.L. Punja? Terence McKenna, in this case, uh, again, you can read words of unstinting praise, over-the-top praise, from Sam Harris calling Terence McKenna brilliant, genius, an inspiration, pathbreaker, and he's none of those things. You can hear Terence McKenna speaking in his own voice here on YouTube. You can look up his writings. I would describe him as a ranting lunatic. And the only reason why anyone, including Sam Harris, would find any kind of authority in the ramblings of Terence McKenna is because they're desperate for anyone to find a spiritual justification for what is simply brain damage in the form of hallucinogenic mind-altering drugs. And that's what Terence McKenna provides you with. He provides you with a so-called spiritual excuse to disregard the hard facts of what modern Western science will tell you about hallucination, whether drug-induced or otherwise. Ram Das, once again, a name you guys are all familiar with. None of the connections between these people and Sam Harris are just my opinion or my conjecture. As you know, he has a leadership role in the foundation promoting the teaching of Ram Das. And most of these other connections you can take straight out of Sam Harris's own books. Or you can also look at the very interesting and, in my opinion, damning list of other meditation gurus whom Sam Harris has invited onto his show, who he acclaims as masters, and who he also invites to provide his followers with guided meditation via the app. Um, that too tells you much more about who Sam Harris really is than the appearance of his face on the poster next to the so-called Four Horsemen of Atheism. And maybe the biggest name of all and the most decisive domino to fall in this analysis is Ken Wilber. Because there's one thing Ken Wilber has in common with uh, Sam Harris. It's that both insist that they have transcended the distinction between science and spirituality, that they are the rightly guided Western avatars who will reach around in the stew of Eastern mysticism and extract from it its most nourishing essence to preserve as scientific fact. And it was complete bullshit when Ken Wilber did this act. And in many ways, the more you know about Ken Wilber's work, the connection between Ken Wilber and Sam Harris, it starts to seem like in many ways, Ken Wilber really was a guiding influence on Sam Harris. And in some ways, Sam Harris is trying to be the new Ken Wilber. I said at the start of this video that these shocking facts have been hidden in plain sight. It's also fair to say that both the mainstream press and we, as members of the audience, have been distracted from the overwhelming significance of Sam Harris's ideological and religious commitment to teaching meditation, to being a spiritual guru in his own right, by a series of controversies that Sam Harris has stoked up, whether cynically or sincerely, resulting in his own, shall we say, rising star or his self-promotion. I think we all have tended to overlook the bizarre religious mission of Sam Harris. Because one, 
He's kind of right-wing. Probably most of you in the audience have an uncle who is more right-wing than Sam Harris, but yes, it does remain shocking in some circles, the extent to which, yeah, he's kind of right-wing. Two, he's kind of racist. I mean, again, you may or may not have an uncle who is at least as racist as Sam Harris. It's not tremendously shocking, but once in a while it comes up. And yeah, three, he grabs headlines with edgy statements about being pro-torture, about being opposed to the tolerance of Islam. He manages to make even bland opinions he holds seem offensive, and he seems to be constantly flirting with far right-wing figures, including, yes, the notorious Charles Murray. Each one of these controversies has effectively promoted his career, but it has also distracted us away from the very simple and I think extremely important question that I'm raising in this video. The critique of Sam Harris as a right-wing hack precludes putting him in the same category as Ken Wilber and Alan Watts, and that is precisely the category he belongs in. He is a white Western spiritual leader teaching meditation, and teaching meditation at a profit, claiming to reinterpret the mysterious religions of the ancient East that he knows absolutely nothing about. Let's, let's make one thing very clear. Alan Watts, Ken Wilbur, and Sam Harris. Out of the three of them, how many could read Sanskrit? How many could read Chinese? How many could read Pali? How many could read, how many did any legitimate, authentic scriptural research? And then you could also ask how many of them did any kind of uh, legitimate anthropological research in terms of the reality of what these religions are uh, in the real world today. And in my, in my biased opinion, it's a zero across the board. Perhaps the most shameful question of all is this. Why don't his atheist colleagues ever criticize his mission and his faith? It seems kind of laughable to me that Sam Harris is sitting on the board of directors. He's the, the number two man in the Hanuman Foundation. It seems kind of laughable to me. But the other people who are sitting at that table with him, literally and figuratively, what do you think their perspective on that would be? What do you think Richard Dawkins has to say about the Hanuman Foundation, the doctrine of Ram Das, so on and so forth? What do you think Richard Dawkins or anyone in his camp would have to say about the excuses for the use of hallucinogenic, mind-altering drugs presented by Terence McKenna, right? Whether we're talking about someone wearing a robe and literally wrapping themselves in the mystique of the Far East, or not, if we're talking about someone who wears a suit and tie and attempts to sort of scientize these claims, right? What do you think Richard Dawkins' perspective is on that? There has been a very strange code of silence amongst Sam Harris's allies. And I've got a, an article clip there in the bottom right corner of the screen. Sam Harris, the new atheist with a spiritual side. There is absolutely nothing but unstinting praise for Sam Harris in that article in the Guardian newspaper. And that's a little bit surprising to me, okay? But the Guardian newspaper can have whatever kind of bias they want. They can promote him from one perspective to another. But I'm asking the question, if you are Richard Dawkins, or if you are just a fan of Richard Dawkins, would you not be inclined to condemn this in the harshest terms possible? And not just to condemn it, because it's taking the ancient superstitions of India and East Asia and repackaging them, promoting them for modern Western consumption. But wouldn't you condemn it all the more harshly because it is taking the name of science and dragging it through the mud? This is partly an insult to the religions of the Far East, but it's much more importantly an insult to science. Right? This is presenting pseudoscience as science in a way that's dangerous and in a way that people like Richard Dawkins are supposed to be passionate about opposing. So where is the opposition here? The fact that Sam Harris claims his cult of meditation is scientifically valid is nothing new. Hindus, Buddhists, and con artists like Ken Wilber alike have claimed for years to reconcile science and Eastern mysticism. This makes it more important for real scientists to refute him, not less. I'm going to close the video by reading to you now a letter from a member of the audience, someone who wrote in in response to my earlier videos criticizing Sam Harris just a few days ago. Let me remind you that this game of misrepresenting the ancient wisdom of the East as newly discovered European science 
is not new. That was a game really invented in the 1960s by the so-called TM movement, Transcendental Meditation. And what's noteworthy there is that they started off by presenting themselves as uh, westernized and deracinated as possible. People would start off being told that Transcendental Meditation was a purely scientific, therapeutic exercise of the mind that had scientifically proven benefits, medical benefits, blah, blah, blah. But then step by step, they'd be drawn into a cult where they were presenting flowers to a statue of the great leader, all dressed in traditional Hindu robes, chanting in some kind of broken Sanskrit, step by step, you know, the veil of science and scientism was pulled back to reveal a tremendously strong cultural continuum of what I can only call cult culture. So the viewer writes in to say, Hi, I watched your video on meditation. I went to a silent Vipassana retreat years ago. I realized on day six that the Vipassana program started out very secular, and little by little it got extremely religious. The lectures started out so friendly and quickly turned to dogma. Hours were spent meditating, and I came to a profound but obvious conclusion while I was there. The conclusion is, under the right circumstances, I can believe anything. It wasn't what they were teaching, but I figured it out. I feel like I got lucky. You are one of few people I've found kind of saying the same thing that I figured out. Thanks for your videos. I hope we can chat soon. The study of religion consists of the study of errors accumulated over millennia by humankind. The study of religion, for those of us who truly are experts, burdens us with the awareness that if we don't take urgent action, those errors of the ancient past can still be just as powerful in shaping the future of our culture today, and even worse. Terrible people with terrible motivations can reinvent the wheel they can make all the same errors all over again in the pursuit, more often than not, of money, fame, power, respect, and sex. And I sympathize to an extent because what most people call the corruption of religion, at least I can say that's real. When you strip away the ideology, then you're left looking at the reality. Call it corruption or not. Money, fame, power, respect, sex. Will people tell lies to get those things? Yes. And will other people believe them and make them rich and powerful beyond their wildest dreams? That's not just something that happened centuries ago. It's happening right now in the 21st century every day. And who, who is going to stand up and do something about it? There was a time when people were supporting figures like Richard Dawkins because they felt now, finally, at long last, there's somebody who will stand up to do something about it. And they were wrong.